okay? So I've talked to a couple people about whether this works um, if you just click on the application or whether you actually have to launch it at, from the terminal window. Um, I tend to do things from the terminal window because that is who I am and that's how I interact with the computer. But you can certainly access it by double clicking on it too. Clearly I have a Mac. You can access it from either command line or clicking on Windows machines or on Linux machines too. If you double click on it, it will, it's supposed to anyway, launch a terminal window and then start DS9. If it doesn't, some of you have already told me it doesn't for you. Um, you may need to make sure that you have X11, which is X Windows, installed on your system. If that doesn't work, um, let's talk offline and we'll see what we can do to figure out what's going on. So the way that I tend to interact with it is I tend to use it from the command line. And when I do that, I can tell it um, DS9 and then I pass it the image file that I want to use. But for the moment, um, let me actually, um, because when, I, when I, I have it set up to do something special. So let me make sure that it's going to do exactly what it will do for you when you start it. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, okay, we're going to start another window because I just screwed myself up there. I was trying to unalias it so that it would come up looking exactly like it does for you. But it's not going to work that way. Okay, so DS9, it comes up like this. Um, and you have a couple of different menus here. You have menus across the top, which if you click on them, you'll have you can you get pull down menus, which have lots and lots of lots of options. The most common options are going to be here in this menu bar here, and it comes up by default with file clicked because it's assuming that you're going to want to open a file. But there's lots of other choices. And when you click on the thing in the top row, the bottom row changes to give you the most common options under each of those menus. So let's go ahead and get something. So if I open a file. I have one already that I pre-loaded, uh, pre-selected here. And you can see that it's loaded it in pretty quickly. It's a fairly large image here. It's giving me the large scale view of the entire image. And then the cyan box here is just what I'm seeing in the screen. So I can drag this and the view down here in the big screen changes. For me, it's come up with a default stretch because that's what I was trying to do by unaliasing it, which broke a second ago. So um, if it, it may come up with a pretty ratty stretch. So the first thing that you might want to do is change the scale. So if you click on the scale menu, you can choose lots of choices. There's Z scale, which is the best stretch in terms of getting a quick look at the data. But there's lots and lots of other choices that you can use to change exactly what it's doing. Um, you can do, it comes up by default, linear Z scale, but you can also do a log Z scale, and all sorts of choices. Um, you can also zoom in or out in order to make it to see more of the image. You can tell it zoom to fit, just make it fit whatever it, it needs to be. Um, you can also choose from the predefined collection of zoom options here. Um, if you want, if you don't like grayscale, you can choose all sorts of garish color schemes under the color menu. Um, you can do, you can, you can you know, make it look as hideous as you want, or draw out details in whatever form you need. Um, you can also change the contrast. So the quickest and dirtiest and easiest way to do that is to use, if you have a three button mouse, the rightmost mouse button. On a Mac, you need to hold down the control and the command keys, and then click and then you can change ex you can change the contrast by moving the mouse down. You see the rainbow at the bottom is over a smaller and smaller area. If I move it up, it's over a wider and wider area. And then if I move it left or right, the center of that scale moves left and right. And this is showing you, this is mapping that tremendous depth of data that we have in here, the, the, thir the 16 bits deep image here, into these colors and I can change the contrast you know let's say that I'm interested in the texture in the outermost most part of this nebula well I can move all of my color range to the outer part of the nebula if I'm interested instead in the very brightest parts I can move my whole color range just to the brightest parts so you can do all sorts of really complex manipulations here um, and if you don't like what it did, you can always get it out, get out of it and get back into it and it'll come back up with a default color scale so it undoes whatever 
um, complicated color rescaling you may have done. Um, up here at the top, it tells you the file name. Uh, if there's an object in the fits header, in this case, it's not. there's not a viable object. It will tell you. Um, and then as I move the cursor around on the image, it tells me at the top what the value is of that pixel underneath my cursor, as well as the right ascension and declination. It's also giving me the physical X and Y pixel coordinates. So remember I was talking earlier about how it's doing that transformation for you. It is taking those X and Y pixel coordinates and translating them into right ascension and declination. And so it is, that's exactly what it's doing. That's exactly what it's telling you on the top. So that, for example, if you're on my team and I tell you, go investigate the properties of a source at a particular right ascension and declination, you can move your cursor around until you find that object um, and then uh, you know then you can uh, understand it you can investigate its properties or do whatever else you need to do with it um, if you want to get into if you want to have some additional options up at the top here so let's say for example you've tried um, a a color scale and you kind of like what it does in the outer reaches of a nebula but you want to see what it does and you want to fix the scale in the bright regions. If you go up to the scale menu, you see those are all the same options you have in the menus over here. But then you have lots of additional choices here where you can tell it, you know, I really only want you to use 97% of the data. Or if I go to all the way down to the bottom, there's scale parameters. And that's actually giving you a histogram of the distribution of brightnesses in this image. And you can dynamically say, I just want to look at the brighter end or move that back and say, I just want to look at the fainter end. And you can see the image is changing um, depending on what I'm asking it to do. Um, you can change that you can, you know, you can change the, all of the uh, wide variety of um, options here. So you can spend quite a bit of time diddling the image to get it exactly the way that you want it. Um, Let's see, what else can I tell you about the basic stuff here? Um, if you want to actually see what the fits header looks like under the file menu, you can say display fits header and there it is. It's telling, these are the basic information that all fits files have, which is telling it, okay, it's a two dimensional image um, and it's 16 bits deep and this is how big it is in pixels. And then the rest of this stuff is all telling it, um, telling you where this image has come from. It's come from a UK Schmidt um, photographic plate POS survey. It was the 3AF emulsion. So it's giving you lots of useful things here. And then the rest of this stuff is all having to do with astrometry. In other words, that translation between right ascension, declination, and pixels, and exactly where the image was obtained. Um, so lots of good information in the header, and sometimes it's useful to be able to access that. Um, if you want to uh, say, for example, if you have an image um, that you're not sure which direction is north, you can go to um, frame, match, frame, WCS. I'm going to let that linger for a second so it's because it's three submenus deep. It'll, it turns out this image was basically already north up, so you probably didn't even see it tweak, but it's, it's basically north up. We'll use that a lot more in the next few minutes. If you find that you're using um, a lot, one of these submenus a lot, this dashed line here means that you can rip it off and it will st spawn its own window so that you can have it sort of chronically available to you as another window next to your window so you can use it when you need to. Um, Let's see, you can overlay coordinates. WCS is the World Coordinate System, so right now it's giving us coordinates in J2000. Maybe I want to read out coordinates in 1950, or maybe you want to read out galactic coordinates. Let's try galactic coordinates. So you can see the image rotated, and you can see up at the top it's actually giving me coordinates in galactic coordinates rather than right, right ascension and declination. So let's put it back in J2000. Let's say I want de decimal degrees rather than um, sexagesimal you know, hours, minutes, and seconds. There we go, that's decimal degrees. So lots of, of coordinate transformation, which in practice can turn out to be extremely useful when you're actually trying to find sources in the image. Um, under, let's see, I'm trying to find, let's see, coordinate grid. It, if you're trying to find images, uh, objects in the image, the coordinate grid is also very useful. If you pick coordinate grid, it will just overlay one with somewhat of a garish and possibly difficult to read um, color scheme. So if you go back up to the analysis menu and choose coordinate grid parameters, you can change everything it's doing. Color for the grid, for the axes, axes numbers, I hate that sort of neon green. Let's make them black. 
apply, and now they're black. So you have lots and lots of flexibility in what you can overlay. You just need to get into some of these submenus and start mucking about with it. Um, I did, uh, because this is powerful and because you, you guys have access to a lot of different FITS images, I did want to show you what it does if it can't find astrometry in your image. Because if you're using teles data from a, teles from a relatively small telescope, it might not have the WCS attached. This image here comes from the U.S. Naval Observatory Telescope. It's one of the, the images I've actually used for some of my research, but it arrived to us without any astrometry. So you see up in the WCS boxes in the top there isn't anything and that's because the computer has no idea how to translate between X and Y on the image and right ascension and declination in the sky. And so it's just giving you X and Y, that's all it can give you. So if this happens, then you know that your FITS image doesn't have WCS attached and you're going to have to go find another solution for getting that WCS attached. And there are things to do that. Um, you might want to investigate something called astrometry, not astronomy, but astrometry.net. Um, there's a way for you to upload an image and tell it where you, like an initial guess of where you think it is, and it it will attempt to attach astrometry, in other words, the WCS, to your image. Um, okay, so if you want to make a three-color image, you can do that too. Um, what I have here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually let me show, let me explicitly show you how to do this. So you, I'm starting DS9. I have file open, and if I do um, channel one from this image. It's a fairly large image, so it's going to take a second for my computer to display it. Choo, choo, there we go. So you can see it's a fairly big image because in this, this little tiny patch of sky here is that tiny cyan box. So this is a relatively humongous image, and so if I zoom out you can see that it's a fairly big image. Um, and this is of course just grayscale, but what happens if I want to make a three color image? What if I want to actually pick different wavelengths for different bands and see if I can learn something more about the astrophysics that's going on in this region? So if I go over to file, sorry, frame, and for the frame menu I can ask for a new frame, which is also going to be a new, in essence, grayscale image, or I can ask for new RGB, meaning red, green, and blue. So if I click on New RGB, it's going to give me a new frame here, and it's going to give me this pop-up window that has red, green, and blue layers in it. So now I can see that the dot, that the radio button here is, is clicked for red. So I go back over here and do File, Open, and I'm going to pick the image I want for the red frame. Um, typically, that one, you need it to be the longest wavelength. It doesn't have to be, but traditionally, it's the longest wavelength. And mine's going to come up by default with a... Um, z-scale stretch. Now I'm going to go over here and pick green and then go back to file open and pick my next wavelength and then blue open and then pick my last wavelength. So you can see that it's now stacked up the images. Um, they, it's aligned them all with right ascension and declination and things that appear in all all three of those bands look white, but you can see I've got some pink stuff in the background and some of those stars look awfully blue. So maybe I want to change the scale for one of the frames. Let's go pick red again and then pick scale and then pick a different scale. It's going to think about it and change the scale. So if I do that, now the stars look white which is closer to what, let's say, I want to portray in the image that I'm generating. And you can see there's a lot of nebulosity there at the longest wavelength that I picked, except for in this region here. Um, if I hold down Option and click anywhere in the image, that is moved to the center of the image. And I can zoom in and I can see, oh look, there is a nursery of about 400 baby stars in there. So lots and lots of interesting choices you can make. You can scale images differently. You can also choose images of different spatial resolution that when you stack them up in an RGB image is going to tell you something about what is bright at the various levels, at the various bands. So if I'm going to leave the red one clicked, go over here and file open, and then picked, pick a 24 micron image, a long wavelength image, it's going to come up with the um, same scale that I had picked before, so let me um, get it. Come on, there we go. That's a better scale. 
So now um, the, the overall tone of the image is different and you can see in the regions where I have only one band of data that one band is blue from that plane, that one band is green from that plane, and that band is, is red from that plane. But if we zoom in on some of these regions you can see things that are bright in some bands but not others. And that, that particular case that turns out to be an image artifact that turns out to be scattered light. But you can also um, investigate other properties like here we have a bunch of red ringed objects and that's because those objects are very very bright in the red band. You can see that up here in the right there's a zoom in on where my cursor is in the upper right and you can see that the core of that object is white because it's got flux from R, G, and B planes but then there's this red circle kind of around it and that's because the, tw the red band, the image I chose to put in for the red band is poorer spatial resolution so each individual point source is larger in the red band than it is in the other bands but the things that are very bright at 24 microns in that red band are going to show up and going to be really obvious even if you look just at this image and you can see that there's red rimmed objects all over the place and those it turns out are some of the most embedded baby stars in this region because they're very bright at 24 microns so you can do a lot of interesting things not just combining objects of, or images of similar resolution, but you can combine obj you know, images of different resolution to, to learn different things about the image. So let's say that we have here um, the Im an image that we really like. We, we found the scale, we found the color scheme that we really like. If you go up here and you can do save image you, it'll try to save the frame as fits if you really want. Um, of course, we already have it as fits. You can save the image and it will come up and ask you, do you want to save it as a GIF or a JPEG? Probably not, but let's try this for illustrative purposes. Let's save it as a GIF. We can put it in that directory. Um, that's fine. Interesting. Um, maybe we can't do that. Save image as JPEG. Yes. Okay, so it's going to think about it. Okay, so they've actually, it used to be the case that what I was trying to demonstrate was that you can save, you'll end up saving just a chunk of the image and not the whole thing, but they've actually inserted better error trapping since the last time I tried this. And so it's actually telling you the entire image window needs to be visible on the screen. So what I was trying to demonstrate and failing is that it used to be the case that it would save just what you're looking at. But in this case, they've actually told you Okay, that it's not going to do that. So let's have the entire image window available on the screen. Save image. Let's save it. You can save it as a TIFF 24-bit or PNG 24-bit. That's what you want because remember GIFs and JPEGs are 8 bits deep and so you're going to lose some of the, the texture in that nebulosity. Let's see if we can actually demonstrate that if it will let me. Sigh. Zoom to fit. JPEG. Okay, maybe not. Okay, um, we'll try that again later. Let's see if we can ch save it as a PNG. We can save it at all. Fascinating. Okay, in theory, um, I, certainly on my other computer, I, you can save the image that you've they spent so much time diddling the colors to get it exactly right. You can save it. I recommend, again, that you save it as a, at least a 24-bit, so PNG or TIFF, not a GIF or a JPEG. I don't know why it's not working for me right this second, probably because I'm actually doing a demo. Okay, 